Thank you all so much for coming. I'm Patricia Tomlinson. I'm curator at the Appleton Museum of Art, and we would like to welcome you to the Artist Outlook with our fabulous artist, Maggie Taylor. We're very excited this evening. And before we begin, I wanted to let Maggie tell you a little bit about herself. I'm sure most of you are familiar with her, but those of you who may not be as familiar, I just wanted Maggie to say a few words about herself. Maggie? Okay, hi everybody. So I'm in Gainesville, Florida, where I've lived since 1985 when I came to graduate school at the University of Florida. And um, I'm a digital artist, although I started out as a photographer and I got my MFA in photography from University of Florida and did really traditional photography, still life photography until about 1997. Then I started doing digital things and using Photoshop in a very early version, like I think version two or something crazy like that. And since then I've just been doing everything on the computer and I love scanning things and using my cell phone to capture things and blending them all together. Um, I've done a couple of book projects and Alice in Wonderland and the Through the Looking Glass that were both shown here at UF at the Harn Museum and some other books and just random images. I normally just make whatever I feel like making. And I have different galleries that sell my work around the world, different places. And for the most part, that's it. I have, I love gardening. I love living here in Gainesville and being outside most of the year, although it's been pretty rainy and gross the last few days here. And other than that, that's what I do. Terrific. Thank you so much. Um, I, somebody already wrote in the chat that they love your work. You're their great fan of yours. So you're already getting praise <laughs> from our public. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about this evening, but when we, in the very beginning here, is influences. Um, now, I did read, you know, sort of how you got started, which is a pretty fascinating story in itself. But one thing I thought was really interesting that I haven't really seen explained too many places when I read about you is that you have a philosophy degree from Yale and then pivoted and went into photography. I would love to learn more about that. <laughs> well, I think so many things in education are predicated on have really, having really great teachers. So in my case, I was at Yale and I ran into a couple of interesting philosophy classes. There was philosophy of art and philosophy of architecture. And I took those and I loved them. And then the same teacher was teaching philosophy of death. I thought that sounds interesting. So anything that professor was offering, I signed up for. So luckily in that um, liberal arts model, we didn't even have to say what our major was until junior year. And I love that we were encouraged. You actually were required to take a super broad array of classes. I had to take forestry and science and languages and all kinds of things. And I think that was a really great thing for me. So at the end of Three, two and a half years, basically, I realized I have more philosophy courses than anything else. So that might as well be my major. And I think it was actually very, very similar to being an English major or a history major or an art history major. And I had roommates that were all those things. It was a lot about reading, reading and writing papers and learning to be a, a critic, learning how to critically read and, and write things. And I loved it. But one of the photo courses I took, I started taking photography because it was kind of an interesting thing. And a lot of people were thinking photography is kind of a history class in a way, like American history, you're wandering around taking pictures of an American city. So I started that. And one of my professors said, would you like to work in an art gallery in New York for the summer? So I said, sure, I don't really know. I, I never thought about living in New York City. Uh, at that point, I think I'd only been in New York City two or three times for a brief visit. And so I said, sure, sign me up for that. So suddenly I was working full time in an art gallery, a photo gallery in New York City. And then I realized this is really what I want to do. And, and I want to go to graduate school in photography. Okay, well, that's a that's a wonderful story. Yeah, I know what you mean about the art history. I'm an art historian, and it's it's all about critical reading and writing. So that's it's a lot of fun. But it's, yeah. it's really wonderful that you sort of flex both sides of your brain. And as we start to look at your work a little later, 
I, I frankly see psychology and a lot of those types of images and markers in your work. So I think you haven't lost it at all. <laughs> no, it just teaches you how to ask questions in a way, like what, what should you believe everything? What sort of questions should you ask if you want to be a critical reader or think about what's behind things? And, and that affects my art every day. I mean, I'm filtering through all kinds of stuff every day, whether I'm watching the news or reading a book or talking to a family member on the phone or Zooming or whatever, all those things filter into my work in some way. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about inspirations. That's a question that um, visitors to the museum and visitors in general like to hear a lot is, especially with artists, they can actually ask the questions of, what do you, do you have individuals or genres that were really your inspiration art wise? I mean, I guess if I go to an art museum, my favorite things to see would be if there's medieval painting, if there's something really early, if there's Hieronymus Bosch, or if there's surreal art like Rene Magritte or Dolly, that sort of thing, I would always make an effort to look at those things because they really resonate with me. Um, and other than that, it's just random. I mean, I go on Instagram every day and I see random stuff by artists all around the world. And I could be inspired by someone's color palette or the fact that someone put a cat on someone's head or, or whatever. And like, I'm always buying photographs. I thought I had one here, but I don't know what happened to it. I buy small 19th century photographs all the time on eBay. And I find them very inspirational if it's a particular costume or look of the person I might want to scan it in and use it well and that's one thing I'm, I'm going to talk to a bit more in depth with you as well I see a real fashion thread going through your work as well and we can we can get to that in a minute so um yeah I think that's really interesting uh, another thing I wanted to talk to you about is how how you kind of got involved in doing it digitally and 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 talking a little bit about your process i mean i'm i'm sure it's unique to you and i know you may not want to give everything away but i think the visitors will find it really fascinating to hear how you take a 19th century image that you've purchased off of ebay and make it into this wonderful new thing can you talk a little bit about that Sure. I mean, um, initially, uh, if you want to know about like how I started using Photoshop, I was, um, I'm just trying to make my view a little better here. It's sort of hard sometimes. <laughs> I, I didn't want to see because nobody has their camera on, so I don't need to just see people's names and stuff. There we go. That's better. Now I can just see Patricia. That's good. Um, I started as a regular photographer working in the dark room for over... 10 or 15 years, like developing my own film and images. And I liked working that way. I was married to Jerry Yulesman, who was my teacher at University of Florida for more than 25 years. And um, he was definitely an influence too. And partly because of the way that he worked, which was just blending things like taking different negatives and saying I don't know what I'm going to come out with there could be a boat there could be a cloud there could be a person in the image let's try some things and see how they work and I thought why can't I do that but with color photography and I love color so I was always working in color you really can't do that very well it's very very difficult so the people from photoshop came to Jerry in 1996 or so it was pretty early and they said, if we send you someone to help you and tell you what computer to buy and pay you something to buy the computer, could you make an image that could be an example of what you could do with Photoshop with layers? So you might have a, the layer of clouds, layer of the boat, layer of the ocean and so on. And he agreed to do it. And they sent a very nice guy to our house to set it up. And Jerry said, no, it's not for me. He, he, he checked it out and he's like, I don't wanna sit at a desk all day. He was so comfortable at that point in his life working in the dark room. Maybe he was already over 60 at that point. So he was like, no, I just want to, you know, have my blues music playing and be in the dark room and, and make my work. Sitting at a computer would be completely 
frustrating to him to try to figure out do you push control alt delete or or whatever is that so for me though i didn't like the dark room that much and i just thought it's fun to um learn something new so i took the little book of what came with photoshop and taught myself over a few weeks and from that point on i never went back to the dark room i just loved it so that was the first half of your question and I, now I forget what the second half was. Okay, well, I just wanted to say a little comment too. I think that's really interesting. I read somewhere too, you said you, since you were in Photoshop so early, it was much simpler in the beginning. And I remember that. I would. I used to be fantastic at Photoshop and now I can't make it work to save my life. So it, it is amazing how the technology has progressed in a relatively short amount of time. Yeah, and back in 96, 97, there really wasn't any online training available for it. It was just the booklet that came with it. And honestly, the book was like 40 pages. That was it, 35 pages. Like, there you go. You've got an eraser tool. You've got a lasso tool <laughs> and those others, you know, the clone tool or whatever. You just read about those and do what you want with them. And I was a beta tester for Photoshop for oh, quite a number of years until I kind of just got too frustrated with my computer crashing and stuff, but it was fun. And every time they come with a new update, you only have to learn incrementally that little bit more. Like what are the newest tools and tips and things I need to know? So I still like it, but at this point, there's quite a lot in Photoshop that I don't use. I never use 3D. I don't know what the heck I would do with that. Um, there's, there's stuff in there that I just, completely ignore now video timelines and all that stuff I, I don't do that okay fair enough my the second half of the question that I had asked was a little bit about how you actually make the work um how you take a 18 I'm sorry 19th century photograph that you purchased on eBay and craft it into this whole other thing could you talk about a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how you do it Sure. So if I have an old photograph I want to use, if it's under glass, for example, a daguerreotype, I take it out from behind the glass very carefully. So I'm not going to scratch it or damage it. And then I scan it in on my little flatbed scanner that's like a Epson V750 or V800 or something. It's a kind of medium basic eh, scanner. And then I scan it in in the best quality I can, and I start to retouch it and play with it and think about what I might want to do with it. I don't really know ahead of time. It's not like I know oh, this woman is going to have a bunny coming out of her head or something. I really don't know. So I just start to retouch, add some color to the clothing, put her in an environment or him in an environment, and then figure out what I want to audition. It's kind of like a kid playing with things. I just audition different stuff in there and see does this feel right? Or maybe recently I photographed a boat and a boat has to go in there or something. It's kind of random. Um, and that's why I think it's your everyday life affects you because if I've been somewhere recently and photographed something cool and interesting, I'm going to want to put that in that image. So, and then I'm adding colors, I'm adding layers and you build and build and build. And eventually you come to a point where you have to pare it down and you have to be the editor. And then it's like, yeah, we don't need 15 horses and pigs surrounding the woman or something. Maybe we just need one and find the one that's a good one, that sort of thing. Edit and then play with the colors and make a test print. And I usually end up working on things for something between two, two weeks would be the minimum I've ever worked on something, but usually it's more like four to eight weeks. Lately is more eight weeks or longer. And then I make test prints, check the colors. Often I'm working on another image at the same time, maybe two or three images. And I want them to kind of correlate color-wise or feed off of each other. So if something is not working in one image, it might spin off into one of the other images. So it's just kind of a random symbiotic relationship between the images. And eventually I reach the point where I'm happy with my test print and I make a final print and then I'm done. And that's like a big relief. Okay, fair enough. I think this is the perfect segue to start looking at your art. So let me get it up on the screen so everyone can enjoy it. I forget what we're even looking at. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see soon. 
So part of what I think is very charming about your art, and I do think that's a pretty good adjective, it, your art is very charming, um, is your titles. And I, I, this one in particular, I think is hilarious because calling someone a little goose goes of course way back in time, which also matches the era from which you take some of your images. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit, how you kind of come up with your titles and some of the things you do that way? Well, normally I like the titles to be kind of not too, I don't want the titles to inform you too much about the work. I want the title to be something somewhat silly and fun that's just open-ended. I don't want it to give you too much information. But in this particular case, this image was from my Through the Looking Glass series where I did illustrations um, for um, Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. And it was my second round of this because I did Alice in Wonderland back in 2006 to 2008. Um, so this was like 10 years later, I came back and spent like three years doing through the looking glass images. And it was important to me that for all, both of those series, the titles of the images had to be lines directly from the text in that chapter. So there's a place here where the white queen says to Alice, you're a little goose. And the white queen turns into a sheep and morphs back to the white queen. Alice may or may not turn into a goose, but she's called a goose and she moves in and out of a shop and a river and back to the shop. And the river, by the way, is the Ishitukne up north of Gainesville in Fort White. So it was just like a, a way to, um, these titles are a way to respect Lewis Carroll's text. And I, and I published the books with the whole original text in them. So in this case, you can see in the reflections that the white sheep is the white queen. And we know her from a, a different image in the book too. And the goose is Alice. We see her little reflection there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's delightful because it's really quite subtle. I looked at, of course, the main two animal figures for quite a while. And then my eye traveled down following the oars. And then boom, I saw the reflection that were people. And while I was working on this, they changed so many times. For the longest time, I had the Alice head up top and the Queen's head up top. And then I realized, no, it's so much more engaging if it's just animals in the boat and let the reflections be the real people. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. So let's go to another image. And I like, I love, once again, I love the title of this one. <laughs> you want to talk about this piece a bit? Well, this one started out as the idea that there would be a, a self-portrait that somebody would do. And I didn't know who it would be, if it would be a monkey or what, but I wanted to use something a little more 20th century. So normally I only use 19th century imagery, but I thought, why don't I include a typewriter and an old fashioned looking telephone and make like a selfie situation because people are so obsessed. And, you know, this was done this past year during COVID when we're in the lockdown here and everybody's so into everything, Zoom and so on. So I thought, well, I'll do this. It'll be a selfie thing. And I finally realized I don't want it to be a person there. I tried any number of people in the image and it just wasn't working out. I thought, let's just put a monkey there and then the monkey can do the self-portrait. So you see coming out of the typewriter, there's a little piece of paper that has the picture of the monkey on it. And I tried many different things as the background, different rooms, and finally decided I'll put a painting back there. And part of the painting is um, a very old Netherlandish painting that I photographed in a museum in Europe, but I modified it a bit and added my own butterflies and a magnolia from my yard and a little beetle that I photographed and just different things to sort of make it more my still life in a way instead of someone else's. And then, although we don't even know who the person is who made the original one. And then, um, I don't know, somehow it came to me that the monkey needed something more interesting. So I made the Magnolia crown, um, which it, it worked out okay, I think, I don't know. <laughs> but it's supposed to be a self-portrait. Well, and I, because, and also to me, this piece is really two pieces because obviously you've altered the painting in the background and then you've got the figures up here in the foreground. So to me, it's almost a double work, which I find really interesting as well. Yeah, and I, I love art history. So I like going back and looking at old paintings and modifying them. And the reason there's a big sheen on the painting 
is when I photographed that particular painting in the museum in Europe, there was a bad lighting condition. And I like that. I don't mind that. I, I embrace keeping that in the work in some way because I think it kind of gives you a sense of a point in time, like an anchor point in time. Like it's not a perfect reproduction of the painting. It's more how I saw the painting. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. And we have this charming rabbit who has apparently whooped it up the night before. <laughs> yeah, so this was another one that was from a painting that I photographed in a museum in Germany. And it's, if you think back to that genre, there are a lot of paintings of the hunt results, you know, a dead rabbit or a dead quail, maybe with some cheese or bread or something like that displayed on a beautiful table with maybe with an oriental rug or something so this started with one of those paintings and i thought i feel so sad for the rabbit is there anything that we could do to make the rabbit happier so i took the rabbit out and added eyes and opened them up to make it look more like a live rabbit still and it took a little bit of work like taking the ropes off the legs and stuff like that and then I thought, what has the rabbit been doing? Maybe it's just, you know, coming off a little martini party or something and put something in there to prop it up instead of hanging from a rope. So I had a stack of books I had photographed and I thought, well, I'll try those in there. And maybe some little party hats. She has her party hat on and then there's a little blue party hat in the background distant um, and a little olive and a spilled glass there. So, and it's called the toast of last night because my grandmother always had a little saying where if she was a little hungover, she would say, the toast of last night is not so crisp this morning. <laughs> so she's the toast of last night. I love it. I love it. Clearly, I'm going to make a guess here. I think, I think I'm right. Clearly, you're an animal lover, correct? Yes. I've always had a lot of pets in the past. I don't have any pets right now because I tend to travel a lot, but... I love animals, yeah. If I could, I would have three dogs and a couple of horses and maybe a couple cats too. Yeah, my sister lives in Atlanta and I love visiting there. She has nine horses, two of them are mini horses, three dogs, including a Great Dane and countless other just fainting goats and all kinds of other stuff. So that would be fun. Wow, you can, well, at least you can get your fix with your sister for the time being. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's go to the next one. Now, something that I wanted to discuss too, um, I see a lot of symbols, otherwise known as iconography in your work. I see repetitions of beetles. There's a little mouse we're gonna see, the mouse in the tutu, we see that her, her I'm assuming, quite a bit. Um, obviously birds, lots of winged creatures. Do those have special symbolic meaning to you or why why do we see the reappearance of those specific object or creatures again and again hmm. i i think i don't want them to have one particular meaning that has to be the same for everybody but they're kind of like a symbolic vocabulary um jerry my ex-husband used to say he liked things that were obviously symbolic but not symbolically obvious so the idea would be maybe the beetle means something to me and i particularly like that little scarab beetle character and i've used a few of them different times in my work they are recurring characters but does the beetle have to mean one thing to everybody else absolutely not um, it's kind of open to people's interpretation Certain things I really love. I, I love fish, maybe because I have been in, living in Florida since I was 11. I love birds. I love butterflies. I love nature. I love my garden, growing things, scanning in flowers. I like domestic things. I like houses, small furniture, and the moon. So all those things kind of come together in this image in a way. And I don't mind reusing things. I used to think I never ever want to reuse something. If it's been in one image, I never want to use it again. I feel like that biscuit has been licked. Like you're, you're not going to go back and use that again. But since COVID, I've, I've given myself, like since we're all stuck at home working and I can't get out to photograph as many, as many things as I would normally, I kind of 
have been into the idea of reusing and recycling. And I like that because then I'm bringing back some of my personal favorites from past images and weaving them in again. So a bunch of the things here are, are things I've used before. The house was used in, a, in an image called the architects and also in something in Through the Looking Glass. The tree I've used before, the chair I've used before, the goggles I've used before, the woman's different and new and the boat is different and the elephant's different, but it's kind of fun to give yourself permission just to reweave things and see what else you could make with them. That makes sense. Now, one thing I did wonder about, and if it doesn't have a specific meaning, that's perfectly fine, but the, the image of the boat going through the center of this woman, does that have some sort of meaning or did you, it just look right to you or? I tried so many different things in there. And at first I actually had the boat in front of the woman and I didn't have the cutout through her. So I, I knew I wanted her to be in the water in this environment because actually I was already working on a man's image that was in the water and I knew I wanted something there. I tried a lot of different animals there because there's a man image. I don't remember if we have that in this or not, but he has a polar bear swimming through him. And I tried like a different totem animal for her and just nothing was working. I thought it would be possibly the elephant, but the elephant accidentally came into the image really big. And so I put it up on her head and I thought, well, I prefer it there. What else can go in her? So my idea is she's getting ready to go on a voyage in some way, or it's like the voyage of life or something like that. But other people don't necessarily have to see it that way. <laughs> Well, and I love how the elephant, it almost is, a his trunk is almost a curl of her hair, if you will. I think mm -hmm. that's a, a lovely little image right there as well, how it sort of seamlessly goes into her hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a fun one to work on. Even if I would turn off all the other layers and show it without all that other stuff, her head looks really good with an elephant hanging off the back. <laughs> And then I'm going to ask another question, and I hope this doesn't make you angry, but I also notice a steampunkian thread. Is that intentional or happenstance? Because the goggles, you know, those the Victorian people with the goggles and various sometimes mechanical type elements and things like that is often associated with the steampunk movement. I think that people who are interested in Victorian fashion and culture like a lot of the same things that I like. I wouldn't say that I'm like some uber fan of that, but the fact is I look at a lot of Victorian photography. I never photograph people myself. I, I hate photographing people, I'm horrible at it, but um, I like looking at Victorian photography. That's what I spend all my time searching for on eBay and stuff in the mornings. So it makes sense to me that I have a similar vibe to I mean, as I understand it, the steampunk people are also fans of Victorian arts and culture, and they put them together in their own weird way, the goggles and so on. Um, and these are actually, that's actually binoculars, my, grand, my great grandmother's binoculars, but I scanned them and put them back together in a couple different ways to make it look more like a goggle. Okay. Um, yeah, but I, I like steampunk aesthetic. I've never bought anything steampunk. It's not like I buy steampunk jewelry or something, but I like that aesthetic. It's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at the next one. Of course, this is a direct, to my mind, this is a direct reference to Las Marinas by Velasquez. Was, talk to us a little bit about your, your process here. Well, I was visiting Madrid and I knew this painting, the original painting from art history class at Yale probably. And I remember reading so much about it and I should have given you the slide of the original one there, but um, it has the painter and the Spanish Royal Court in it. So I thought I, I thought I could photograph it in the museum and use some part of it in my work but the museum did not allow any photography. So I was kind of pissed off about that. I love the Met in New York because they let you photograph virtually everything and it's so amazing. Um, and so many other museums let you do that too. There's a place in Amsterdam called the Rijksmuseum that has a very open website where they encourage people to download high quality images from their collection and make what you want with them. And it's really fun. So anyway, I saw this in Madrid, I came home 
amazed by how big it was in real life and had a great impact. I loved it, but sort of disappointed that I, I couldn't photograph it even just as a personal sketchbook reference or something. But then I saw, well, you can download a basic image of it on the internet anyway. It's all over the internet, very much reproduced. So I took it apart and reconfigured the room. The only thing in the real image that's left here is the artist easel and a little bit of the door in the background and a, and a little bit of the structure on the right-hand side of those um, bars and columns or paintings hanging on the wall, whatever they are. So then I just put my own paintings in the background and decided instead of having a man as the painter, and in the original painting, it's a man, a grown man painting a little girl. And so I thought, why can't the girl be the active one? She could be painting something. So she's like the star of the image and she's painting her dog. So she's looking at the back of the canvas there. We're just seeing the back of the canvas. And we suppose what's on the canvas, what she's painting is the little image behind her of the dog in the crown with the yellow crown on that's in a mirror. And this is her dog with her, but she's imagining that he's wearing a crown, I think. That's what I thought anyway. <laughs> okay. And there's our mouse. There's the mouse right here that I, the mouse in the tutu or the mouse in the skirt that, that mm -hmm. she makes occasional appearances. <laughs> yeah, there used to be a store in New York City and I think it's probably still there. It's changed names a few times. It used to be called Maxible and Mandible. Then I think it was called Origins. It's down in uh, Soho and they sell little taxidermy animals. And I don't know why I, I find them really creepy and yet compelling, but I bought a, a mouse or two there over the years. And one time I called them and asked if they had another mouse and they said, sure, we'll make you one. What color do you want? And that kind of really upset me. It's like, well, they're just mice. They're waiting to be taxidermied, I guess. I don't know, but I do have a few taxidermied hamsters and mice here. Okay. And I, then this is a good one to also talk about the fashion thread. Um, obviously, older works of art are very cognizant of textiles and the opulence of textiles. And I see that thread through a lot of your work. Does, does fashion play a large part in your work in your life? Or talk to us a little bit about that, please. I like fashion a lot. Actually, I really love clothing. I mean, I even have a little mannequin over there that I dress up periodically. And I like to buy particular things on eBay to wear and stuff like that for, for me personally. For my work, it's kind of hard because a lot of the Victorian images have very particular fashions in them that I don't want. I don't wanna see a bridal dress or a communion dress or a funeral attire. And it's hard to find things that don't have one of those three things in them. So to find just a more ordinary dress is difficult. I do find more and more lately, I make my own clothing for the people over the last 10 years or so. And I mostly make it out of doll dresses. So in this case, I scanned a doll dress that has this nice little eyelet lace on it. That's her white part of her skirt. And I scanned a linen and silk table napkin that becomes with folds in it that becomes the red part of the skirt. And then in Photoshop, I could make any kind of belt. So I made the stripe belt in Photoshop and the collar, the you know, white stand-up collar is something I photographed in a museum in Mexico of, it was like a painting of a man that happened to have that nice collar. So I just lifted that out and put it in there. And the lace came from somewhere else too, the lace on her sleeves and then the dog's collar too. So I find I take things from multiple sources and try to put them together to be kind of like the fashion of my dreams. That's what I, I would like it to be. Okay, okay. Let's look at the next photo. Another thing I wanted to mention quickly that I really find wonderful about your art, especially now that I'm talking to you about the specifics of you making it, I start, now I'm starting to look at it and think, well, is that blue morph butterfly something she really saw, for example, on a trip to Costa Rica? You know, I'm like, what's real, what's not? <laughs> well, a lot of the things are real, but I didn't necessarily see them where you would think I would see them. Way back in 1999 or 98, when I first started working with a scanner, a friend of mine from Monterey, California gave me a huge collection of butterfly wings. And he said, I, I don't really have anything to do with them. I photographed them already and I don't want them anymore. Do you want them? Well, 
Yeah. So I still have them over here somewhere in one of these drawers. And I have lots of different ones, particularly quite a number of those blue morphos. They're beautiful. So I scan them both sides and then I can put them together to be the real butterfly if I want, you know, scan the brown side of the wing and the blue side. I have to piece them all together and make a fake body, but it's not that hard to do in Photoshop. And then this little scale, the top half of this is a scale that was something I photographed at a, at a museum in Paris, the Musée des Art et Art Métiers. It's like Arts and Crafts Museum or Arts and Craftsmanship Museum. They had the scale, it was really nice. It didn't have these two gold or brass scale holders on it though. They were from a different scale that I photographed and it didn't have the swirly staircase that was from something different than I photographed in the same museum though. So I, I was able to put all those parts together from that and I was kind of excited about it, but I didn't know what they would be weighing. And I didn't have the butterfly there, but I did, I had some other objects. I had a canary and some other stuff there. And I had the cloud there on the right hand part. And for some reason in the morning when I was looking at the New York Times online or something, somehow I saw a link to an article that said clouds weigh much more than people think. And it was kind of an alarming article about how like a big thunderstorm cloud outside is massively heavy. You don't realize how much water vapor is in there. And it said, for example, even just a small cloud of one cubic meter weighs as much as a monarch butterfly. And I thought, oh, that is very interesting to me. Like that tells me what I need to put on the other side of the scale. So that's the way like everyday life just weaves into the work. If I hadn't been inquisitive and been reading that stuff, I, I wouldn't know that. Okay. Might've have, might have had two clouds there or something. I don't know. Uh-huh, uh-huh, lovely. Now the ba the background's lovely on this one. Where's where was the background taken? Do you remember? Oh, it's so many different things. So there's there are th two or three different paintings in there. Sometimes I photograph the edges of paintings in museums, and the the trees are partly the edges of paintings, but it's not strictly one painting. It's like two or three paintings kind of layered up on each other. The grass is grass in the foreground from my yard, like overgrown grass. And there's some clouds in the background from my yard or from somewhere on Payne's Prairie, I think. And then there's another painting that has this weird uh, rectangular sheen on it in the background too. So usually the backgrounds could be anywhere between five and 20 layers just to build that up. And I change them as I'm printing and testing and stuff. Oh, that's amazing. Let's look at another one. A little, maybe a Florida girl <laughs> with her, yeah. her friend. <laughs> yeah, so in t until about 10 years ago, I mostly used tintype images because they're inexpensive and I could go down to like the Ren and Jersey Antique Fair in Mount Dora and re reliably buy a bunch of tintype images. They could be anywhere from $3 to $120 or something. Then I got kind of hooked on daguerreotypes and this girl is a daguerreotype. So she's on polished silver and much more detailed and kind of glowingly beautiful. The only problem is the daguerreotypes tend to be anywhere between like the minimum might be $200 and sometimes they're, they go way up into the thousands. So I have to be a lot more careful buying them and know for sure that I wanna use them for something. So she was one that I used in the original Alice in Wonderland book. She's from 2008. And there's a scene in there where it's something about mustard uh, and things that bite. And Alice also has a kind of fixation with things that fly and pigs having wings and stuff like that. So those things kind of came together in this image. The people have very stark expressions most of the time because these were long exposures. You know, there could have been like a 30 second to one minute exposure. So they were probably having to blink during the time. You never see any eyelashes. You don't see much hair detail. Sometimes I have to fake that and add it myself. But in this case, her hands were very, very still. A lot of times you see there was like a little movement during the thing and the thumbs or hands fingers could be blurred but she was obviously sitting very very still that's so. beautiful well and i love i love your layering of all the colors in this where you got the, you have the cloud clouds mimicking the pink of the flamingo you have the greens of the trees mimicking her dress and how it has this relatively strong diagonal that's that's very dynamic 
Yeah, that's kind of different for me because I use a horizontal landscape all the time from, I think just from being a, a Florida person and living here for so long. And I, I live facing south onto Payne's, Payne's Prairie and I just see this horizon all the time. I get up every morning, go to bed every night with this plain flat thing and I see the rain over Ocala in the distance. <laughs> There's been a lot of it lately. One of the things I wanted to talk about too, and this is a good one because it is one of your earlier pieces. And I think I had read this um, that you said about your work as well. You started off more simply and then you became much more layered and much more complex in your compositions as time went on. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, it's just like kind of as Photoshop has changed, I've changed and gotten a little more technically better, I suppose. It's kind of like the th closest thing I could think is someone who plays a musical instrument. If you would play the, the banjo or the piano or the violin or whatever, you over time become so comfortable with it, you can just sit down and not think about how are you doing it, you just do it. And at this point, that's basically what I feel about Photoshop. I'm not wor worrying about all those other extra things I told you like 3D or whatever but I feel very comfortable doing what I want and I can easily just build and build and build with lots of different layers. And it gets very complicated. Sometimes I have to use layer sets and grouping things together and very specific masks on things and stuff like that, but it's fun. It's kind of like doing the New York Times crossword puzzle to me. It's just a fun puzzle. Like, how could I make that happen? I don't know. Today I was working all day on an image. Like most days I just sit here and work all day. I usually go out for a run and then I do some weeding in the garden and then I come sit all day on the computer. And I was working on something where I have a lot of different animals diving into the water off of a raft or some sort of, I don't know exactly what it's gonna be, but some sort of a construction in the water. And I just go on and on and on trying different things like auditioning different stuff. And every single one has to have color adjustment layers and masks, shadows, like even like in this image you're looking at now, there has to be a shadow of the flamingo head that's just on her. There has to be a shadow from the little pink mustard jar just on her and so on. So anyway, that's kind of what I do. <laughs> So let's go look at another piece. So this, this is a perfect juxtaposition. So when we look at the simplicity of your earlier, and then we look at the incredible complexity of this one from 2019. Yeah, and I, and I would say actually that earlier one with the Flamingo Girl, that wasn't all that early. That's still pretty complicated. There, there were a lot of layers in that. Um, but yeah, this one has even more because these days, if I'm going to make a bouquet, I and I, I love making a still life image once in a while. I like to um, do each flower separately. I'm really bad at flower arranging and I'm always disappointed if I photograph a, a real life bouquet. I just can't do it justice. So I scan each flower or photograph each flower. So some of the flowers are just scans and some are taken with my iPhone and then I, I piece them all together. So some of the ones that are a little more three-dimensional, those are with the iPhone. Some of the flatter looking ones are on the scanner. And then each one has to have a shadow and an individual little color adjustment. I have scanned, I mean, probably 500 different ferns from my yard, all different kinds of ferns, sometimes just little teeny ones, bigger ones, piece of a staghorn, whatever, I scan them in. And then each one has, you know, could, could be in this image or it could be in any image. So I have a folder of ferns that I, I could pull those out and put them into something. Um, and after I was working on this for a while, I like this idea of this strong light coming in and that's a piece of an old painting. And I thought I've got to have something else besides the bouquet there maybe a glass, like a glass of wine or something could be over there on the side. And I think it was at Mount Dora, the antique place there, I had found a single Venetian goblet that was really pretty. And that I had to, I can't scan that because it's not gonna really work well in the scanner. So I just did an iPhone photo of, of that. I don't have any kind of fancy camera or anything. Um, so I photographed that Venetian goblet and at first, I just put something like a, a line in there that could look like champagne or something. And then I thought, no, that's too boring. So I might as well try something else. Well, 
maybe try a fish in there. But then the fish, it was a goldfish and he was kind of boring. And it's kind of hard to see in, in this Zoom version of it. But in the end, the entire fish is covered with zinnia petals. So it's kind of not a real fish. I don't really know what it is. So that's why I thought I'll call it the alchemist chamber because maybe the, the zinnia is morphing into, instead of into gold, like an alchemist could do, it's going into a gold fish. Okay, that makes <laughs> sense because I immediately went to the fish transforming. I just didn't know the particulars. So that's really wonderful to know. Yeah, like the alchemist could take base metals and turn them into gold, apparently. You know, that was the myth or something. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea, well, we could take a marigold and turn it into a goldfish. Wonderful. Well, it's, it's or a zinnia, whatever. <laughs> it's a beautiful image. Okay, let's, okay, now we come to ours. We are lucky enough to have this beautiful piece within our permanent collection at the Appleton. And I love the title once again. And I, this is a really, to me, this is a very psychological image. It's very complicated. And I sit it out, it's on view in the gallery and I sit out there and look at it a lot. <laughs> so I'd love to get your take on it. Well, this image came about because um, back in about 1998 or so, maybe, could it be 98, 99? I, I met a poet here in Gainesville and her name is Lola Haskins. And she's a very interesting poet that writes sort of free form poetry, all, all different topics. And she had written a series of things about women whose names begin with the letter A. And she wanted to know if I would work with her to illustrate the book. And I was kind of intrigued by it. In the end, we kind of decided I, I it takes me way too long to make things. I mean, I only make about 12 images a year. I think this year I might only make 10 images, who knows? But so we decided she should look back through my catalog of work and pick some that could go with them. And in other cases, I would make something. So she had one particular poem about a woman who was tearing at herself all the time. And to me, it sounded like she was paper and brittle and just tearing things apart. So I made this image and I didn't have that pose I had the woman's tintype of just the woman with that little lace collar and dress but I had to manufacture the skirt out of some ivy in my yard and then I just held my hands up over my head like this and did a self-portrait of that I think I'm wearing like an Ann Taylor gray jacket or some such thing and just put those in there so I just like the idea that she's kind of so fragile she's made of paper we don't really know maybe she's just a photograph we don't really know what she is and the background that I chose to put behind her was from another a separate old tintype I I think it might have been from New Orleans this particular tintype but it has a couple of old buildings and a and what looks like a a live oak tree in the background just blurry they're just painted I think as a backdrop so I thought I'm just going to call it southern gothic that seems like what it is <laughs> well that's fascinating that it's your your own hands how often do you appear in your own art a lot of the arms are mine and sometimes even if I need some other part of a face it's surprising like now actually you can do a lot more with photoshop than you could even a few years ago the probably the newest version that came out last fall lets you change people's gaze change their age it has a lot of other filters in it that you can use but previously we didn't have that. And so if you wanted to add something a little bit different, it was kind of like plastic surgery with layers in Photoshop. So I could photograph myself or my niece or a friend or whatever, and just kind of layer those bits and pieces in there. It's hard to make older, it's hard to make almost 60 year old hands look like 20 year old hands though. So it's better to have a little bit of a a folder or catalog where you keep that stuff, photograph other people's hands and feet and faces and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, and I love one thing I really love too, is you've got this little Virginia creeper creeping out into the space and it would be a completely different piece if that Virginia creeper were not there. Yeah. And that was really from my yard. <laughs> so I, I felt like the, the Ivy was from my sister's yard in Atlanta and I wanted to try to put something else in that was local, a little bit more foreground for me. So that's why that's in there. 
So it's, it's a great piece and we're, we're very thrilled that we have it and we love it very much. And as I mentioned, it is on display for those of you who can make it to the museum and come and enjoy it in person because it's a terrific piece. So let's go back to our normal looking at our faces. <laughs> um, thank you for a walk through your art. It was fascinating. One of the things I wanted to ask you as well is we are, the Appleton Museum of Art is considered a campus of the College of Central Florida. So education is primary to our mission. And I was wondering if you had any good advice or tips for individuals who are either emerging artists or for those who want to become professional artists. I mean, I think the toughest thing is just to keep making work. And it's so easy to get discouraged and find some reasons to not make artwork. There's a really good small book, and I know it's, it's popular over the years with people who take workshops, and it's called Art and Fear. It's by Ted Orland and David Bales. It's a very small paperback book, but it's just kind of a good inspirational book that kind of highlights this idea of you've got to get in there and struggle with making artwork if that's what you want to do. It's not always the happiest, prettiest thing, and you might rather do a hundred different things. So whatever you can do to get yourself working all the time and stay motivated is really important. I don't even think that anybody that, I could be wrong, but I don't think there's anybody I went to graduate school with that's still making artwork. So many people get their MFA degrees, this, you know, now it's even more, I'm sure, and they're just not going to make it as working artists. So it's very, there's a high rate of attrition. And I, and I think there are a lot of psychological reasons for that too. You know, like you enter competitions is one of the things maybe you should do if you're trying to get your work out there. And even for me, I think I have like a 98 or 99% rejection rate for everything I do. It's hard to deal with that as an artist. So keeping on making work and keep trying entering things Befriending other artists is really key. Um, over the years, I went to various events, for example, Houston Photo Fest or uh, Photo NOLA in New Orleans. Uh, there are a number of different ones around the country now that are sort of review events where you would take your portfolio of work, like 25 images or so, and have people look at them. And most of the time, I felt like I got a lot of rejection. But the really key thing was I met other artists that I could identify with that were like at my same point in time in terms of exhibiting their work. And I have stayed in touch with so many of those people and it's really helpful. Like that becomes your network. They don't have to live in Florida. They could be, you know, wherever, but there are a lot of those good little review events and stuff. They're popping up everywhere now. I think there's one in Raleigh, New Orleans, Richmond, Virginia, Houston, Seattle, Portland, all kinds of different places. All last year, they were all online, which is makes it easier too, you know, that you don't have to actually travel there. But you're mingling with like-minded people and trying to find a connection there. And then you might find someone who says, you know, I like your work and I have a gallery that wants me to curate a group show. Would you want your work to be in that? And those kinds of things, those have helped me a lot along the way. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. I wanted to mention to everyone as well, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat section. Um, Maggie is happy to answer questions if you have any. So just you see the chat function at the bottom of your screen. If you could just type in any questions, we'll see if we have any thus far. Oh, I see the ghost whisper question. I don't normally look at the questions because I would need my different glasses on, but I have... <laughs> I have my, I have several different pairs of glasses here. Now I can put my real ones on. Um, Ghost Whisperer, those people asked me if they could use 10 or so of my images for the opening credits of that. And but that was years and years ago. And they animated them. I, I don't know how to do animation. So they did that. They did an okay job. But the funny thing was they said, oh, it's Jennifer Love Hewitt. It's only going to be on for one season. It'll be a failure TV show. And so they didn't actually pay me all that much. I wish I had known because it's still in syndication all over the place. So that was a kind of funny experience. That's terrific. I, I don't, I did not know that actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. They um, used that one from the Appleton, but they replaced the face with Jennifer Love Hewitt's face and she's like ripping her hair oh, over. Yeah, you've got to oh, see that. Look that up. <laughs> 
Um, and I, I don't see very many questions. I guess we did a really good job of covering your art. I'm not seeing too much. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Your work is mesmerizing. Uh, someone appreciates that you, you're inspired by medieval and surrealist sources. And if people want to know, like if people are aspiring to create stuff and they don't really know what, what they want to use, I mean, you can't use other people's copyrighted imagery. And, but there are some great sources online. Two of my favorites are that Reichs Museum. It's R I J K S Museum. And it's in Amsterdam. They have a free thing you sign up for called Reichs Studio. It's free. You just put your email in there. And you can download absolutely amazing, beautiful, large quality images just to play around with if you're just getting started with collaging or something like that. Um, and other places like the Met Museum have it too. And my other current favorite is called Biodiversity Heritage Library. And those people have a Flickr account. So you, you go on Flickr and that's like a place you can see a lot of pictures. On Flickr, you look up Biodiversity Heritage Library. They post new stuff all the time, but it's a huge archive of old books of animals and flowers and everything, all free to use and, and really very decent quality images to download. Well, that's marvelous. I want to get on there just for fun. Yeah. Uh, we did have one question come in quickly. Do people ever send you pictures? Oh, you mean like maybe people to use or something like I'm that. I'm assuming that's what she means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm kind of weird about it. I like having them myself. Like I have shelves and shelves full of my collection here. I really like the idea that I own a rare image or a one of a kind image that like with the daguerreotypes and ambrotypes that are on glass. I like the idea that I have it. Um, occasionally I've worked with someone else's, particularly if it's someone I know and I want to do something for them. For the most part, no. One time I had a weird thing happen where a guy called me up and said he was selling his whole collection of daguerreotypes and he lived in somewhere North Carolina. And he said he, he wanted to meet me at the Whole Foods in Spartanburg or Columbia, South Carolina the next day at 10 a.m. And he would have a suitcase full of all these images and I could have them all for like $500. It was kind of weird. So I hopped in the car and drove up there and sure enough, it was really good stuff. And I was so excited. This man had been collecting forever. A lot were kind of damaged images, but I could totally use them. I was like, man, this is like years worth of fodder for, for new work. It's so much fun. That's fantastic. <laughs> I have a question of my own, actually, that I wanted to ask. Have you ever, or would you ever, show the original photo next to your new interpretations of them? Oh, yeah, I like to do that. Like, a lot of times if I'm doing a, a lecture or a workshop, I show people like that and the stages along the way of how it got there. And I have done it. Um, I had a show, I've had things like um, the Harry Ransom Center at the University of Texas has a bunch of my work there and I've sent originals there just on loan and other places have done that too where they want to show people are often surprised how small the originals are. I mean, I wish I had that one little one here that I had earlier, but I don't know, but some of them are only like one inch tall. They're very tiny. I can't get up now. I can't get up and walk over there because I'm actually only <laughs> dressed for Zoom and I have sport shorts on. <laughs> oh dear. Um, we have another question that just came in. Tammy asks, do you spend a lot of time working to get shadows and lighting sources to match from the different sources used in one art piece? Yes, that is one of the biggest things. Like when I teach workshops, uh, that's the main thing people really need to focus on. It, it takes a little while to piece something together and figure out what is your composition? What are you thinking your colors are gonna be? What needs to be in and out of the image? But then it comes down to what I just call the shading and shadows. So you have to decide is the light from this side or that side? Then some things might have to be flipped horizontally. Do you have to put in adjustment layers for curves to darken things? You have to put in appropriate soft enough shadows. So I spend quite a lot of time on that. And I don't love that so much. And I spend a lot of time like labeling the layers, typing in the names of them and obsessively saving different versions of every file. Um, but yeah, you have to focus on that. 
And that's what takes so long. You know, you might come up with a really cool composition in a day or two and be psyched about how good it looks and think, oh, I, I have an idea for my colors. I have an idea for everything. But the craftsmanship of the image is going to take a while, making sure that all the layers more or less match. That's the hard part. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. Maggie, is there anything else you would like to add before we sign off for the evening? No, I'll have to get down there to the Appleton one of these days. I don't come to Ocala all that much, but I drive by on the highway all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd absolutely love to have you. You can come say hi to your baby. Yes, we'd, we'd absolutely love to have you come visit anytime you would like. Okay, great. <laughs> So before we sign off for the evening, everyone, I did want to mention that those of you who may not be familiar with the Artist Outlook series that we do, it is an ongoing series. We have done quite a few prior to Maggie's this evening, and we will do several after through December, and then the series is supposed to end. So I did want to invite you to join us. They, they typically are the third Thursday of the month. Now with holidays, sometimes we have to adjust, but traditionally they're the third Thursday of the month. So the next one will be July the 15th, um, 7 p.m. here on Zoom. And I will be interviewing artist photographer and artist Kenda North fascinating photographer. She does a lot of her imagery in water, which gives a real nuanced um, look to what she's doing. Of course, clothing flows in water, and she does a lot of botanical and floral imagery in dip, you know, immersed in water as well, which of course the, they always want to come apart in the water. So you have to capture the moment just prior. So really interesting, beautiful work. So we invite you to be part of that once again on July the 15th at 7 p.m. So we look forward to that. And thank you again, Maggie. It has been an absolute pleasure. I very much appreciate your time and your amazing talent. Thanks a lot. It was fun. Okay, terrific. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. We appreciate you. Good night. <laughs>